Good morning again. Welcome back to Foundations of Algorithms. So if you remember where we left off yesterday, we were talking about efficiency and trying to figure out what an efficient sort might be and under what conditions it would be efficient. This led us to the quicksort algorithm, which we said was going to be faster asymptotically, so when you got far enough out over the x-axis, when your n became large, when you had lots and lots of items, quicksort would be a much better approach than using insertion sort. Why? Because its growth behavior was better. The amount of time it would take to run quicksort would be faster than our insertion sort. But we only started to see how it works. Let's do a, a quick recap, and then we'll go into the detailed workings of the algorithm and actually try it out. So our schematic was this very simple process. First, we pick a pivot. We just pick one element, and we'll, we'll discuss how to pick the best pivot in a little bit. So we pick this element, we move everything that's smaller than it to one side, and everything that's larger than it to the other side. And then we do the same thing on the smaller side and the larger side. So we go back to the smaller side, we pick an element, we move everything within that smaller half to the left, everything that's larger than that new pivot to the right, um, and then we keep repeating this process. How do I know when I can stop repeating this process? Open question to the audience. When can I not break up my algorithm anymore? Yeah. Well, that would be one thing if you knew that it was sorted. Ahmed, um, you answer a lot, sorry. Michael, I've already heard you this week. I need someone new. Who hasn't answered a question before? Yeah, what was your name? Uh, Michael. Michael. Uh, when there's um, one element on each side. Yeah, so when there's one element to the left and one element to the right and one element in the middle, we know that all the elements on the left are smaller than all the other elements. We know that the element in the middle is in between and we know the element on the right is bigger than the, those to its left. And so if we only have three elements, that means those three elements must be in sorted order. So given that our function quicksort has this recursive pattern where we do the same thing to the left, we do the same thing to the right, we split it up again, we do the same thing to the left, the same thing to the right, when we have one element, what do we call that in a recursive function? You can just shout it out. Base yeah, base case. So we have a recursive function. We know what we, we're going to apply the same recursive function to our left side, to our right side. We know that in the middle we just, uh, and each time we do this partition step, so we sort things into smaller, middle, bigger, and then recurse again, recurse again, recurse again, until we get to one item. And so to help you understand this process, I brought a friend with me today. Um, this is a friend you've seen once before. The big brain is back, so I need a new big brain for today. Who wants to be my big brain? Go for it. Big brain. Round of applause. And you know, when the big brain is here, I also need a host of other volunteers, so I want people who haven't come down to the front before and who don't answer questions all the time. So hands up if you know that's you. There are definitely people in the audience. Okay. Um, and a quick round of names for everyone. Dao and Ella. you are up, and we are going to run through. Let's let's actually stretch this line out a little more. Come over here, Bronson. Um, yep, and Ella, you got to make sure that everyone can see you. Hold up your numbers at the front so everyone can see what number we are, and we are going to do our quick sort. So let's choose a pivot. Who are we going to choose as our pivot? Um, going to choose Owen. Okay, that's an interesting choice, but we'll go with it. Okay. So now what we do is we're going to go through our array, and what do we do? The first thing we do before we do our recursive calls? Um, make a call. So I said that everything on the left has to be? Small. And everything on the right? Has to be larger. So let's go through and do that. OK. okay. Sure. So let's start off over here. Um, so we're looking at five. Um, so. Are we smaller or larger than five? Smaller. So we're smaller. So do we need to do anything? Is it? Is it? So we're saying this. this smaller, smaller, smaller over here, larger over there. Okay. So. Can you hold that at the same time? I'll try. Um, so Angela says that. Um, okay. Eight. Long. And wait, wait, wait. We've, we've done something wrong here. Remember last time we were hiding all the numbers. So let's do that. Everyone turn around. Okay. Except the pivot, who is Owen, because we're always going to be looking at the pivot. Okay. So we've looked at Angela. Now, who do we look at next? Um, Eugene. This, this five in general. Um, eight, that's larger than five. 
and hold the microphone pretty close so we can hear you. So eight is larger than five. Are we on the right side? We are not on the right side. So what are we going to do? We're going to move to the right side. Which, can we just move or are we going to do a... Is it a swap? A swap, that sounds better. Okay, so let's do a swap. Okay. So it's a swap with the pivot. Yeah, a swap with the pivot, that seems to work. Alright, okay. okay. So we're moving, moving along. We're we should probably turn him around again, because we've looked at... You can't swap. Turn you around. Miguel. Has to be Number next four one. is smaller than the pivot, so we're going to have to move you to... Um, well... So what problem are you running into? Like, fa face the camera and the class. If we're swapping, then the issue is we're just going to put it back out of order. So if we swap um, four with Angela over here, then what will happen is um, two will be on the wrong side again. So. so maybe we need to start keeping track of some extra things. What do we need to keep track of, perhaps? There's some kind of boundary over here, isn't there? Mm. So what's, what's true of it over, over this side? On this side of O, and what's true? Smaller than five. And what's true o on this side? Well, equal to five. Do we know that yet? No, not yet. We don't, we don't know that yet, but we know that over here everything was smaller, and we know that um, over here was bigger, but I've got a better idea. Let, let's rewind, let's Eugene and Owen swap again. Let's, let's go back here, okay. and now let's make a clever swap. So let's keep track of the boundary here where Angela was, and let's do a swap that puts Owen at the, uh, sorry, that puts Eugene at the end. Let's swap him with the end because we don't know what's uh, over there. Right, and let's swap him with right. Ella. And now we know that on that, because he's on that far boundary, yeah. that that's, that's now the bigger part. Okay, so now uh, we're, let's move on. Okay. Who should we look at now? Uh, so are you looking at four again? Wait, wait, wait. Four. Uh, okay, so we're looking at okay, seven. So, does that mean um, we swap with the second from that? That seems like a reasonable idea, because then we can put all the bigger things over there. Okay. So, second from the end, sorry, what was your count? Uh, come and swap with Alan. So, you're getting the names now, too. This is how I do it. <laughs> okay. So, let's, let's take a look. What do we think? Um, Seven oh, so is bigger or smaller than five. Okay, so now Dow has to swap with a fine gentleman down there. Dutch. Um, with, yeah, so you two swap. And again, six will get you to turn around. Um, six is larger than five, so um, what's your name, sorry? Josh. Josh, so we'll get you to swap with Josh. Zero is zero in the right on the right side of our pivot. Right side, yeah. So okay. We'll just leave it, leave it for now. Yeah. So let's keep going then. Keep going, and we've got a four here, so that's on the wrong side. So you have to swap. Hmm. So remember, we know where this boundary is because we've been keeping track of it. Hmm. So. Is there a swap that we could do that with a place that we're keeping track of? Perhaps the pivot. Yeah, let's swap with the pivot. Thingy. Okay, now everyone turn around for a second. Let's just double check. Not five. It's not sorted, but remember this was only our partition step. Quick sort said, move everything smaller to the left, move everything larger to the right, and everything equal to the middle. Um, yeah, I guess we, we have a, a double two sevens over there, so they're in the right place too. But we're not done. We've only done our parti partition. Once we've finished partition, what's the next step? Recursive. Recursive, okay. so. The, the pivot, uh, Owen, you can step back. Everyone else step forward. OK, now you've got two sides to choose from. Does it really matter which side we're going to sort first? No. Nah, OK, so choose one of the sides. All right. Um, this side, obviously. OK. So I've got to choose the pivot. Everyone else can step back on the, on the greater side for a second. Yeah, choose a pivot. Um, is there a method to choose the pivot? We'll get to that later, but for now, just choose a pivot. Um, let's just go to zero. Um, so start off with Angela. Um, she's not in the correct spot. So, uh, what did we do last time? Well, we swapped with the with the end. 
Okay, so let's do that. Let's okay. swap with the end. Let's swap with the end. Um, and now, okay, now you're not in the right spot, so you're going to swap with the pivot because we already swapped with the end and we give it a try. Um, and now, is everything to the left of the pivot smaller? What's to the left of the pivot? Um, is there anything to the left of the pivot? No. No. Okay. So so that's fine. Now the pivot is is the pivot, and everything to the right of the pivot is larger than. Okay. So we're good. Yeah. Now what do we do? Are we done? No. Is there a recursive call? Yeah. There's a recursive call. Okay. So let's recurse on the left. Is there anything here to recurse on? No. no okay. So we're done. Um, I guess you two should step forward, and we'll do our recursive call. Okay. Uh, so choose pivot. Uh, you can do pivot. Um, it's Miguel. Miguel. Sorry, Miguel. Uh, and we're going to have to get you to swap. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and after we do our partition, what's the next step? Um, we, we did it before. Yeah. To the left, you look on the left and... So are we doing another recursive call? Yeah, one? keep doing recursive calls, okay. Miguel is, Miguel the, is the pivot, pivot. So okay. Angela is the pivot now, is she? Yep, she, she steps, steps forward. forward. And but you're the only... Uh, you're the only like, uh, object in the partition, so that means we're done. So our functions can return. Step back one layer, step back one layer, step back one layer. Brilliant. And now look at this. We have a partially sorted array. Okay, what are we, what are we still missing? Uh, the other partition. Okay, you know what, you know what happens now. But it, it's already... It's, it's already looking good, but... Looking good. It's already looking good, but we still have to do it. Yeah, okay. Um, right, yeah. Uh, okay, so maybe to, to make it clear why we actually ha still have to do this, all of you have to turn around. Because we don't actually know if it's sorted or not. The only way to know that would be if you could see it all at once. Yeah. So we're going to still do our procedure. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, we should be able to turn around and be able to do full. Um, and Dutch. Um, so you're in the correct spot. Uh, so you turn back around and see past you. You're also in the correct spot. That was Ella. Ella, yes. Because uh, you're equal to the pivot, so you can turn back around. And Josh. Oh, you do. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and, I'll be a Josh. Close. And you're in the right spot also, so. Um, so we've we done our partition. So what's the next step after partition, everyone? Still need recurse. Yeah, we're recursive calls. Okay, so let's recurse on the left. Yeah. So, uh, Dutch, I think you were the, the left. Step forward. Okay, we've got one element. What happens? Uh, that's okay. It's okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, you can go back. Let's recurse on the right. Yeah. Um, so, um, so, pivot, how you can be a pivot, so step forward. Oh, wait. No, no, stepping forward is what we're saying when we do recurse. So, so, so she's just the pivot. Yeah. Um, and then you see we turn around. Um, well, you <laughs> turn around again. Yeah. Um, is he in the right spot? He's in the right spot. Uh, beautiful work, Eugene. Um, and so now we... Now we recurse. Again. We recurse. Okay, there's no one here. We don't need to recurse. Yeah. Eugene, step forward. Lovely work, Eugene. You're looking really good. You can move back. Um, and we both move back. And voila. Whoa, isn't that amazing? Let's have a round of applause. Thank you, Bron Big Brain Bronson. Um, and thanks, thank you, you all of you for being our numbers in today's demo. Thank you. So let's step through this on the iPad just in case you missed it. We'll do this pretty quickly because now you've seen quicksort a few times. Um, here is our, our algorithm on the side over here. Let me get a pen that will show up. Right, we have our base case. If you only have one item, return because there's, there's nothing to do. Otherwise, choose a pivot. And in this, in this code, what am I choosing as the pivot? I'm just choosing the zeroth element. I'm calling this P, right? A zero, because we said for the moment, it's not going to matter which pivot we choose. The algorithm seems to work anyway. Then we do our partition. And notice that I'm using two variables here, FE and FG. These are going to be the boundaries. Remember how we had to keep track when Bronson was doing the algorithm of where the small items were and where the large items were, like where those boundaries were? That's our FE and our FG, which stands for first equal. So the first item that's equal to the pivot is marked by that boundary. And then first FG is first greater. 
So the first element that is greater to the pivot. And we'll, we'll see more of that in a second. So we do our partition step, which is just to get the ordering right, everything small on the left, everything big on the right, then do quick sort to the left half and quick sort to the right half. And you'll see the notation we've used here is everything from the left from zero up until the first element that's before the pivot or that's uh, before being equal to the pivot. And then everything on the bigger side from the first element that's greater the to the pivot, greater than the pivot up until the end. Okay, so we've chosen our pivot, move everything small to the left, move everything big to the right, everything the same in the middle. There you go, I've done it quickly. And now we recurse on the left, we do our partition, so I've chosen the pivot again as the first element this time, labeled the items that are smaller than, smaller than and bigger than, and move them into the right sides. There's only one element, so our recursive call terminates immediately. That's just like stepping back again. The 16 was the thing that we pivoted on in the, in the previous one, so remember, we don't need to recurse on the pivot itself. We only recurse on the two halves. So this is our bigger half. Let's recurse again. We choose a pivot. The 18 is smaller, so we swap them and then get 18 and 19. Um, and then because there are just one element left, uh, we can return from that. So now we have the left hand side is, has just been sorted. Our pivots, or all the elements equal to our pivot are in the middle. And now we recurse on the right hand side. So let's do quickly the recursion on the right hand side. Choose the first element as the pivot. We see the smaller and the larger elements, let's move them into the right order. That's our partition function. We'll get back to how that works shortly. Uh, we do it again, repeat this process. We have our single elements. We choose, we have a pivot, we recurse on the right, single element. We have our just sorted part on the left, our just sorted part on the right, everything equal to the pivot in the middle, and our array is sorted. Okay, so how does partition work? Partition is going to rely on these two boundaries. This is after we've finished partitioning, this is a picture of what it would look like. Um, it works, it's all the th same things are true before you've uh, uh, run partition, it's just you have to set up cleverly where you start FE and FG. But let's, let's look at the finished one for the minute. This is when you're done. Um, FE marks the place where the first element equal to the pivot starts. So in this case, what element must we have chosen for our pivot? It must have been 26 because um, everything on the left is smaller, which means our pivot is that element in the middle or one of those two elements, 26 and 26, we haven't distinguished. And then FG is our other boundary, which marks the place where we've been putting all the bigger elements. So just like Bronson was doing, where he was keeping track of, okay, where are the smaller elements? Where are the elements that I haven't seen? And where are the elements that I've put to the end so far? It's exactly what's happening here, but instead of uh, Bronson keeping that in, its head, in his head, we now have our two variables, FE and FG, that are marking out these locations. Um, you'll notice the particular way that our implementation is gonna work when we get to the code. We are setting FE to be at the location of the first equal element, um, and FG is at the location of the first greater element. So it's easy to make an error and accidentally put FE, say, on the last of the small elements instead of the first of the equal elements. So that's the F at the start should help you remember that in our implementation, we're actually gonna place it right at the index where those things begin. So let's try out our partition function. So we need to initialize our variables, next, FE, and FG. So in this case, let's set all of them to zero, so next to zero, FE to zero, except for FG, which we're going to set to N. Why am I setting FG to N? Where am I gonna start my collection of big elements? I'm gonna start it at the end, right? Because I want all the big elements to be on this side. So let's say FG is over here, and everything on this side of FG is greater, everything on that side of FE is smaller, and next is just keeping track of where we're up to. So they both start over there at zero. Here's my code over here that we're gonna follow, and let's actually try and run this out. 
So while next is less than fg, so next is essentially saying all of these elements we have not seen yet. And as next gets bigger, as next gets, oh, let me separate that out. And I'll do next in green. As next moves further and further along the array, this is keeping track of which elements we haven't seen yet. So all the elements between next and fg we haven't processed yet. And what we're going to do is as we see elements and put them either on the left hand side or on the right hand side, we're going to move our boundary markers, f, e, and f, ooh, it's not gonna move nicely for us, will it? We're going to move our boundary markers, f, e, and f, g, to show which items we've already processed and put in their right halves. So let's go ahead and do that again. There's f, g, and I will have my, so while next is less than f, g, look at the current element that we haven't processed yet. So it's gonna start off that we haven't looked at any elements. Yeah, so this is we want to move the pivot further along, and what we're also going to want to do is we wanna move our boundary along to indicate that we have uh, now stored one element on the left-hand side. So let's start tracing that out. So F, E, F, G, and we'll start with Next. Okay, so is 16 greater than or smaller than our pivot 26? It's smaller, so what, do I what did I just say we do? We swap it, okay. So let's start writing out our new thing. So I've swapped them, and now let's look at our code. Now what do I have to do? I'm circling it. I have to move our boundary for f first equal. First equal is there, and I've also moved next up by one. So now the first element equal to the pivot is that 26 that we saw, and our next item is now, whoop, accidentally started deleting it. So now we look at the 19. Is 19 greater than or smaller than 26? Smaller than, so what do I do? Swap, okay. So let's do our swap down the bottom over here just to keep to illustrate it. So 19 and 26, and then the next step over here, what do I do? Yep, we move along our boundaries. So move along our boundaries, now the first equal to is pointing at the right place, uh, and next is pointing to the right thing. Okay, let's do this a couple more times. So now we're looking at 12, 12 and 26, I'm not even gonna ask you. Let's do 12 and 26, and someone point out if I make a mistake, because I'm gonna try and do this a little quickly. Um, and now we have a 74, the first number that's bigger. Okay, let's look at the next condition. So first we check if it's smaller. We're not smaller than anymore. So now we're in this condition. If the item we're looking at is bigger than our partition element. So what have I said here? Our swap strategy is a little different to what we did with Bronson. So what am I swapping? I'm swapping next with the element before fg. So the way that fg is actually working is fg is pointing out the end over here. fg was equal to n, and we know that our last element is not element n, it's element n minus one. So what we're gonna do is we're going to swap 74 with 89. So let's put 74 and then 89. 89 is here, 74 is out the end. And then what do I do with FG? FG is my boundary marker. I've put something to the right, and so I need to move my boundary marker. So FG is gonna go there, and forgive the, the spacing of it all. There's only so much room on the screen. Still visible, yeah. Okay, so if we repeat this process over and over, I'm not gonna step through the rest of the steps. You can see that this will lead to our overall partition, and that is all of quicksort. Quicksort itself, the core idea was really, really simple. It was arrange things to the left that are small, arrange things to the right that are big, and then recurse. And make, oh, choose a pivot, that's the step I forgot. Choose a pivot, move the small things to the left, the big things to the right, and then recurse, and then you're done. That's the whole algorithm. The only tricky bit here is really keeping track of these boundary markers in our partition function. So this gives us our, our basic function, but 
One thing that we still don't know how to do yet is how to prove that this actually works. So I've shown you it works. We've done like, we did a demo yesterday, we did one live demo today, then I did the workings. But how do we know it works? Does anyone have an answer to how we know it works? I like, I appreciate the frown. Okay, why, why the frown? We know it works because we just saw it in the demo. Is that a proof? Not quite, it seems to work. Okay, so what we're actually missing here is a solid argument for why this works. We've seen it demonstrated, I, I mean, I was pretty convinced by that, but maybe there's an array out there for which this doesn't work. So we're going to get to uh, all of our favorite part, which is proof techniques for proving algorithms correctness, which is actually really important and fun and useful. And given that you enjoyed the theory component so much yesterday, I thought we'd do a little more today and then maybe some more tomorrow too. So let's come up with a few things that we know are true about our quick sort process. Just like we discussed very early in semester, what we're looking for are invariants, are things that we know that are always going to be true until perhaps at some time one of them becomes false and at the point where it becomes false, we can draw some conclusion. Now that's a very high level schematic. Let's, let's get a little more into that. We have an invariant, something that we're going to believe for good reason is always true and we're going to try and show in our program that it's always true. This is just some mathematical notation for our particular invariant. You can write it however you like. If you write your invariant in plain English, that's okay too. This is just a symbolic representation of the particular invariant that we're going to use for quicksort. So let's call this invariant R just for shorthand. R is nothing special, it's just a label that we're using for our invariant to write it quickly. Um, and so let's break up R into these few statements. Now you don't have to madly scribble it down because we will, it, it will be in the slides and it's probably gonna be easier than trying to take it all down now. Um, looks a little complicated, but it ends up being rather simple. Let's switch to the translation and then I'll go back to this slide if you want to keep madly scribbling for a few seconds. So the translation is just what we've been saying all along. Both sides of the um, pivot are in the array. So everything on the left is in the array, everything on the right is in the array, otherwise we've made some error. So all the variables that we're using to keep track of the different things in the array have to actually be valid. Then everything on the left is smaller, everything in the middle is equal, everything on the right is bigger. Let's go back and see that again. So FE and FG are two boundary markers in our partition function, should be within the bounds of N. So between zero and N, because otherwise we've put boundary markers in places where the array doesn't exist, that'd make no sense. Okay, that one makes sense. Um, then everything between zero and right up until you get to the first equal element should be smaller than the pivot P. Everything between first equal and first greater should be equal to the pivot, so that's just in case you have the same value as the pivot replicated more than once. So if you have 26 and 26 again, and 26 is your pivot, those two should be in that central location. And then our last statement here is just everything from first greater up to the end of the array should be larger than the pivot. Looks intimidating, but when you break it down like that, it's not as bad as it seems. So then we have our function quick sort. We've already talked about this, uh, we've seen a little bit of the code. We have our base case. And then we have a modified version of the function where now I've used this keyword assert. And now you can actually use this in C and we'll see how to use it in C soon. But for the time being, we're using it just to make an argument. We're saying, give me proof that at each of these points in time, I'm going to check that every time I'm modifying any of the val values that are in my assertion, that are in my invariant, that I still believe the invariant to be true. I'll say that again. Our invariant contains a few variables, and I want to know that every any time I modify anything re related to the invariant, that the invariant itself will still be true. So the, the fact that the things on the left are smaller, the things in the middle are the same as the pivot, and the things on the right are greater, that should be true throughout the course of my algorithm, otherwise I've screwed something up. So we're going to write these assert statements at various points every time one of those values changes so that I can say, well, if I'm not violating the invariant, invariant here and I'm not violating it there and I'm not inviolating it there, well, I've put my assert statements every place that things could have changed. And because my invariant was true, 
at all the possible places where it could have gone wrong, and it was, we still proved that it was true. Therefore, at the end of my program, my invariant must also be true. And then the last step is gonna be to combine the invariant with one extra piece of information that we'll use to argue that the program has completed, and in the completed state, we now get the thing we wanted. What, what was the thing we wanted? Why are we doing this? Yeah, we wanted it to be sorted. So we're using our invariant as a step towards proving that our array at the end of this procedure must necessarily be sorted. So let's look at, let's see what we have here. Uh, let's look at the very first thing. So when we choose our pivot, um, do we know that n is greater than one? And, oh, let's go back. So n in this case we're using to keep track of how many elements are in our uh, array. And so if n is less than one, we're in our base case, we only have one element we return. So we know if we're in this branch, n must be larger than one, right? Because otherwise we would have entered the base case. So n is larger than one, um, and we know that the pivot is one of the elements in the array because of the previous line. So that must be true, okay. Now we've chosen fe and fg, and let's uh, say that our, let's assume for the time being that partition works the way we expect. We'll get to our proof of partition in a moment, but assuming that partition works as we expected and did the thing we want, should our Invariant have changed? Our invariant shouldn't have changed because what we were asking partition to do was to move all the small things to the left, all the equal things to the middle, and all the big things to the right. And so assuming that it's worked, this invariant should still be true. But that's still a hole in our proof for the time being. We're gonna need to prove that for partition. And then we do quick sort on the left and quick sort on the right. Um, and then we can assert that everything on the left side is sorted by, and how can we do this? Well, if quicksort does work, if our proof works, then it'll work for the recursive calls as well. So this will allow us to prove the left half is sorted and the right half is sorted and our invariant is true, which means the things in the middle are bigger than the left half and they're smaller than the things in the right half. So if you combine this, if everything on the left is sorted, if everything on the right is sorted and the things in the middle are in fact in the middle, are in the middle in terms of their size, Therefore, the entire array must be sorted. Any questions on this before we go and continue our proof on the partition part? Yeah. Um, why do uh, give me a sec, Bruce. Yes. Why do we need an assert statement? Um, so the assert, assert statement is just a way of making the argument. Because before I made the argument, it seemed like it was true, but we didn't have a way of actually arguing about it. Wait, so before the else statement, we had our base case. Yeah. Um, if it doesn't go through that base case, of course it's gonna go through this else statement. Why do we still need to assert that? Uh, that so the, the assert is just giving the reader a way to understand the argument you're making. Oh, so it's not an instruction. You can, so I, I'll get to that as well. It is an instruction you can put in your code as well. Why might you want to put an assert in your code? And I'll tell you right off that if the assert fails, the program will terminate, it'll just end, and the computer will complain. Yeah, uh, Josh, um, oh, you should have given me a second. Sorry, <laughs> uh, because if it's about to make a huge mistake, maybe you want it to crash. Yeah, we want to know if our program is misbehaving. So these assert statements tell us that we must have done something wrong with our algorithm, because if the assert statement fails, then our program doesn't do the thing that we're expecting it to do, which means we've made a mistake somewhere in our code. So this is a really good way of catching yourself, have I implemented this algorithm correctly? If you can build a proof of your program's correctness into the program itself through the assert statements, um, then you know that if the program crashes, then you've made a mistake in the code. Now, of course, what's the issue here? Why, why, why is this harder than it sounds? You can make a mistake when you're writing the asserts. Uh, and Eugene said, you said the right thing, I just forgot what it was. Yeah, it's hard to prove things. So A, it's hard to prove things, and B, even if you have a proof in your head, putting it in the code properly is tricky. I still think this is a better way of writing code, but it's a harder way of writing code. Okay, so we still have to define our partition function in a formal way such that we can make the same arguments. Bruce, you still seem? Still processing. Still processing, okay. So, this, this all worked out on condition that our partition statement worked as expected. Yeah, and what was your name? Nia. Nia. Oh, we have spoken before. Um, I just wanted to ask, does it tell you which assert failed? 
yeah, it'll normally give you a line number. It depends exactly what the compiler's done, but it'll typically tell you where. Um, so let's go to, oh, let me take a drink. Um, and let's go to our exploration of the partition function from like a reasoning perspective. So as we said, in plain English, partition's job is to just move the elements around such that, and I'm not gonna say it again so you can say it for me. What's partition's job? Come on, people. Yeah, and on the left is? Thank you. I'm wearing out my voice here. If you don't help me out, there's gonna be no lecture. Okay, so the basic idea is to iterate through the array. If the current element is small, put it on the left of the boundary and then move the, so put it on the left of the FE boundary and then move FE right. If the current element is big, put the element on at the end uh, of the FG boundary and then move the FG boundary left. So remember this was just moving our boundaries up and up and up, so we had all the small things over there, all the big things over there. Um, if the current element is equal to the pivot, just continue along because you don't need to swap it. We have a new invariant, so unfortunately, um, we have to have a second invariant because we have a second function that we're trying to prove something about. And the art of coming up with the right invariant to prove the correctness of your function is a challenging thing and it's something that comes with experience and thinking about the actual problem and what things you know are true with the problem. And hopefully we'll have a few exercises for you this semester to try this out on some, some easy tasks. And also tomorrow we'll have um, another example of coming up with an invariant. So let's break up our new invariant into, the, into its parts again. So what does the first one tell me? All our variables have to be within the bounds of the array. So just like before, if you're choosing where your boundaries are, those boundaries have to be inside the array. And the element that you're looking at has to be at an index that exists within the array. So that's our first line here. Our next line, what does it tell me? Agrim, you can, you can go for the second line. Uh, the second line tells us that the first, uh, all the elements from the first element is the first equal to, like, just before the first equal to and less than the first. Yeah, so this is our same three conditions that we've seen before again. Smaller, middle, equal. And we also have a final condition which is a little hard to read here, so we're gonna do a special slide for it, which is that either condition that appears at the end of the other invariant says that we're in one of these two cases. Either we have already, um, our next thing is past the boundary of first equal, which means that the pivot might be somewhere uh, between first equal and the current item that we're looking at, or we haven't yet passed the first equal boundary because the first equal boundary is moved up, and the pivot is somewhere in the middle there. So this is just saying there are two possible conditions about where we could be relative to the pivot, and we need that for our proof. So now we can go and actually write our version of the partition function, only this time we're going to use assert statements so that we can make clear our arguments about why it must be correct. So we have our initialization, as we did before, we set the current element to, that we're looking at to be the first one, um, the first equal to be uh, zero as well, because our boundary, our left boundary begins at the start, and our right boundary begins at the end, at n. Um, and then we assert our, we assert our invariant. Whew, those words were not coming out today. Uh, yeah. Couldn't you just make uh, the endpoint uh, n minus one? Um, you could make the endpoint n minus one as well. Um, but the, the reason we're not doing that is so that our invariant remains true because we haven't actually looked at n minus one yet, so we don't know that it's a bigger item. Is that what Liam, that's what you wanted to say? Yeah, so in theory, there's nothing to stop your code from working that way if you set up your bounds appropriately, but you'll lose your ability to do this nice proof thing. So our proof only works right now because we know that in this setup, there's nothing to the left of FE and there's nothing to the right of FG. So uh, our statements don't yet uh, tell us anything about those elements. Um, and we haven't yet uh, done anything. So our assertion, our invariant is trivially, trivially true at this point. Okay, here is our main loop. 
So while next is less than FG, so while we still have while we still have items that we haven't looked at yet, because remember when next reaches FG, then we've reached the boundary of items that we've already started moving into that bigger part. So while there are still items for us to look at, assert P, which we know must be true at this point because we haven't changed anything, um, and next is less than FG. How do we know that next is less than FG? This is kind of a silly one. Yeah, it's in the while loop, so it couldn't possibly be in this part of the while loop if this isn't true. And you'll notice that a lot of our assertions leave you kind of thinking, you know, that's, that's kind of obviously true at this point. But this is why it works, is because you are making statements that are necessarily true and then combining them to build your overall argument. Um, so then what we do is we do our little swap thing and we know that at the end of this swap procedure, it must still be the case that P is true. Why? Because if we go back and look at our invariant, if we have swapped a smaller item to the left and we've moved FE along, well, we know that FE hasn't reached past the boundaries of the array because otherwise our loop would have terminated earlier. We also know that because we moved a smaller item to the left of FE, that the uh, FE part of this statement must be true and nothing else has changed. So, uh, oh, we've moved next on one, but uh, we haven't come back to, you notice that I said that next can be less than or equal to n, so even though we've moved next along, even if it hit the end of the array, it's not past the end of the array, and our invariant allows for that. So FE um, and next have changed, but we've just, we just come up with really strong reasons why uh, that first line must be true, and we've swapped an item, so we've changed what's in the array, but because of the nature of our swap, because of where in the loop we were, we know that we must have moved a smaller item in, so that second line is true, and we haven't touched the other parts of the array. Uh, we do the same thing for the other branch, um, and I'm not gonna run through the logic, you can try it out yourselves. The third branch is if we hit something that's equal to the pivot, but now we've just done all the branches, and we've shown that P must be true in every branch. Um, at the end, in order to complete our proof, we have to say that our invariant is still true and next must be bigger than or equal to FG. How do we know that? How do we know that next is bigger than or equal to FG at the end of the loop? Michael. Because like, that's the condition which breaks the while loop. Yeah, so if we've managed to exit the while loop, the only way we could manage to exit the while loop is if next was greater than or equal to FG, if that guard at the start of the loop was false. Okay, so we know that that second part is true. We know that FE is less than next uh, because uh, that's another condition of our loop. And therefore, it must be the case that our overall invariant is true. And notice I have, yeah? What is that syntax? That syntax is um, made up syntax for therefore. Um, and that's our proof, that's it. You've now proven that quicksort is correct because we've shown that all we needed to prove quicksort was correct with these couple of assert statements and proving that the partition function behaved as we desired. We showed, we proved that the partition statement was correct through our invariant and then checking all of the different loops and checking after the end to make sure that our conditions had worked. And uh, now we're ready at the start of the next class to actually look at how quicksort runs. Thank you very much, everyone. I will see you tomorrow for my last day of class with you until after the break.